João Pedro Oliveira is one of the fo foremost Portuguese composers of our time. His work has been international, internationally recognized by means of several prizes and awards, as well as numerous commissions from both national and international institutions and countless performances of around 80 works all over the world. He started his formal music education at Centro de Estudos Gregorianos uh, and um, uh, later at the Instituto Gregoriano de Lisboa, where he completed an organ performance degree under the guidance of Antoine Cibertin Blanc, who has been the principal organist at the Cathedral Church in Lisbon for the past 50 years. In 1978, the year he started uh, dedicating part of his time to musical composition, João Pedro Oliveira launched a career as an organist, which eventually led him to perform in Europe, the United States of America, China and Japan, up until the year 2000. As a matter of fact, João Pedro Oliveira affirms, the organ fulfilled an important role in my activity for several, several years. As he points out, uh, continuing his statement in an interview conducted by composer Alvar Salazar, that for one thing, it was as an organ student that he had his first contacts with contemporary music, as he heard a fellow student play Dieu parmi nous by Olivier Messian, one of the works Juan Pedro Oliveira later included in his own graduation recital. According to him, that contact was made possible by his organ teacher, Antoine Cibertin Blanc, who has, uh, who was open to recent stylistic trends in music and made sure his organ students were familiar with that repertoire, in sharp contrast with a much more conservative attitude that was then the rule in piano classes. On the other hand, performing on the organ served for a number of years as an element of balance for Oliveira. Indeed, after several months composing, he would exclusively flip play the organ for a while, as long as was needed for new musical ideas to start flowing again. While studying at the University of New York at Stony Brook, where he completed two masters and a doctoral degree in music theory and composition from 1985 to, to 1990, he was the principal organist and choir director at the Presbyterian Church in East Hampton. He has also recorded two CDs of works for trumpet and organ with Nelson Rocha. The list of his works, namely in what concerns solo instrumental music, a heading comprising 18 items, features three pieces for organ, Sete Visões do Apocalypse from 1982, Harmonias e Ressonâncias from 1996, and the Iberian Organ Book from 1998, revised in 2006. And these are the only examples of the composer's writing for his principal instrument in his entire output. Quite on the contrary, the piano stands as probably the most frequent, frequently featured instrument. Indeed, we find four pieces dedicated to it, the ones that are uh, mentioned in my presentation. And additionally, the piano is twice treated as a solo instrument with orchestra. Uh, now it's sort of small, but I'll, I'll go uh, over them quickly. So he has uh, treated the piano twice as a solo instrument with orchestra in the 1992 version of Tessares and in Abyssus Ascendens Ad Eternum Splendorem for piano, orchestra and electronics, a, a more recent work, as well uh, as a recurring component of different chamber music ensembles, ranging from 2 to 13 instruments, as expressed in 11 pieces of the composer's catalogue, the ones that are listed here. As we can easily notice, all of his works for the organ were written during the time in which he was active as a performing organist. Quite on the contrary, except for Pyramid de Cristal for solo piano, the 1992 version of Tessares for piano and orchestra, and three chamber works, namely Etude for Five Instruments, Threads One and Threads Two, all other works featuring the piano date from 2000 onwards. We should also point out that whereas the piano is often treated along with electronic means, the organ has never been the object of such experimentation, a fact that may be related to the time span in which the organ works were written prior to the composer's sustained interest in electronic, uh, in electroacoustic technology, but also to more intrinsic motivational issues. 
Despite his obvious move away from the organ as a center of interest, even though the composer quite recently claimed that he would like to take up in the near future some performing projects abandoned for lack of time, I argue that the performing activity of João Pedro Oliveira as an organist has left important marks on his writing for the piano, especially when combined with electronic means, particularly in the work in tempore for piano and el electronics, which by no means compromises the idiomatic nature of his writing for the instrument. Oliveira has acknowledged the importance of uh, the organ sonority in his musical conception, namely in what concerns the treatment of densities in orchestral works and the relationship between instrumental and electroacoustic sound, but he hasn't, to my best knowledge, referred to its influence upon his piano music or his writing for the piano. Yet, in the latter, issues such as register, timbre, and time, as well as physical and ergonomic considerations, deserve to be looked closely upon, and will in this paper be discussed on the basis of musical and performing analysis of the work in question. The composer's writing for the piano, either in the context of solo concerto with orchestra or of different chamber music formations with electronics, will also be referred to in relation, sh in relation to works dating from the first decade of the present century, namely Abyssus Ascendens Ad Eternum Splendorem, Tim Shell, and Entro Aria Perfeição. When we consider the characteristics of the contemporary organ, we're almost immediately drawn to its possibilities in terms of range and, re range and registers, which are obviously closely, closely linked. In fact, its range extends from C0 to C9. Actually, there's, there's one, organ, one organ that goes down to C-1. A unique feature among instruments of the Western art music tradition, made possible by a variety of st stops and mixtures. It is therefore only natural that a composer familiar with this instrument may endeavor to recreate by all means possible similar register possibilities when writing for the piano. That has been the case with Olivier Messiaen, of whom Yvonne Loriot stated, as an organist he has introduced mixtures and diversified the terracing of registers. She actually claims that Messiaen is the creator of the contemporary piano, having opened the barriers that imprisoned it, its regist registers. In a similar way, João Pedro Oliveira, to, him, to whom Olivier Messiaen is an acknowledged, inspiring figure, explores the extreme registers of the piano in a variety of ways. First of all, we notice in his writing the frequent cohesion Ugh. coexistence of very low static burdens, I'm quoting, which we may relate to the use of organ pedals, over which develop, and I quote again, frenetic gestures in the highest register. Measures 133 to 139 of Intempore are a go good example of that and make us wonder if, besides the influence of Mozart and Debussy's writing for the piano, which the composer has acknowledged in program notes for the work, the comparable lightness of touch of organ keyboards as compared to the piano has also influenced filigree-like passages, such as this one. <laughs> In the chamber work Tim Shell, the co coexistence of extreme registers often requires the simultaneity of different playing modes on the keyboard and or directly on the strings of the piano. In these cases, due to the difficulties that such simultaneity creates, the composer often chooses to juxtapose in succession both playing modes. And Waria Perfeição explores similar procedures. To sum up, I would like to say that some of, uh, of the pieces I mentioned in temporary seems to be the one where most examples of simultaneous using of extreme res registers is to be found. From Tim Shell on, direct playing on the strings of the piano becomes more frequent. In Entre Waria Perfeição, the use of different registers is more homogeneous, less abrupt than in previous works. From that standpoint, it seems to be the one that yields the biggest contrast with in temporary. 
The simultaneous exploration of extreme registers may also take another form linked to the additive synthesis of sound. This process is very specifically acknowledged by the composer as something directly issued from his contact with the organ and applies to his electroacoustic music, including piano and electronics works, as well as to orchestral pieces. In his own words, and I quote, if we think that the organ is the first additive synthesis instrument to a given fundamental, we may add the octave, the twelfth, the fifteenth, and so on, up to the highest harmonics, we realize that it may serve as model for two... Uh, I'm sorry, we realize that it may serve as a model for certain electroacoustic sounds. As an example, I should mention something which I have frequently used in my works and that is usually called, in the organistic jargon, an empty register. In this case, the sound consists only of its fundamental and one or two of the highest harmonic partials, omitting the octave, the twelfth, the fifteenth, and other intermediary partials. This type of sonority in electroacoustic music is obtained through the filtering of an intermediary zone of a complex sound, leaving equally an empty space between two extremes, which creates a sonority that I particularly like. I have also used this effect in orchestral music, as many other composers did. End quote. <clears throat> this empty register technique, <clears throat> which, by the way, is in Oliveira's rhetoric associated with transcendence, is once more documented in Intempore, measures the domain of the exploration of different registers of the piano, we must mention rapid, rapid shifts from one extreme to the other. At the organ, such shifts require only a change of keyboard. At the piano, where the keyboard is considerably larger and the bench for the interpreter much narrower and usually aligned with the center of the keyboard, such shifts demand sometimes quite acrobatic moves from the pianists. <laughs> Referring to one of his organ works, Harmonias e Ressonâncias, uh, from 1996, João Pedro Oliveira addresses the relationship between sound and silence, stating that he has tried to work with the organ's capability to hold us a given sound for as long as the composer fancies, on one hand, and on the other hand, with, and I quote, reverberant or colored silences, end quote, linked to the characteristic resonance of a given performance space, like a church, for instance. Therefore, he notices the possibility of dealing with two, within two extremes the maximum duration of a given sonority and a silence which acts as a kind of a negative of that same sonority. A similar alternation may be found in Intempore, a piece likewise punctuated by colored silence and sustained sonorities. To achieve either of those opposed effects, the composer needs to adjust to an instrument in which any sound, once struck, starts its ine inevitable decay process, unlike the organ, where, as we have seen, the sustainability of a given sound or sonority is almost limitless. By which means does the composer achieve these effects in intempore? In the case of colored silences, we must note that, in relationship to the organ works, the composer refers to durations in which no sound is actually being produced by the instrument, but the resonance of a sound previously produced is living in the acoustic space of the venue where the instrument is located, through the natural resonance of that same space. In what concerns piano works such as in tempore, the key element is no doubt to be found in the electronic sounds, but also in the use of the right pedal, as may be seen in several instances throughout the piece. There are a number of examples. I'm just going to show two small ones. So here the sound is obviously prolonged by the pedal and also by what's happening in the electronics.
Even though in the latter case the sound heard during these colored silences is directly issued by the instrument and not only by the acoustic characteristics of the space where it has been produced, as in the case of the organ works, in terms of the musical rhetoric of the composer, the analogy between his pedal sustained or le electronically enhanced resonances and what the composer refers to as colored silences in relationships uh, in relationship to his organ work Harmonies and Resonances seems pertaining. We should also note that in Pyramid de Cristal for Piano, uh, an earlier work of 1993, where the composer doesn't use electronic sounds, there are several examples of colored silences with very precise duration instructions given in seconds. The resonance is in those cases exclusively assured by the use of the pedal. In the, cases, in the case of pieces such as Abyssus Ascendens ad Eternum Splendorem, Team Shell and Entro Aria Perfeição, the question is far more complex given the interaction between the piano and the other on instruments of the orchestra or chamber ensemble, combined in all cases with electronic sounds. Therefore, we don't find in those cases the same clear-cut outline of colored silences. In what concerns sustained sonorities, we notice a variety of processes. The use of trills, tremolos and rapidly repeated notes, either in the piano part or in the tape. The use of um, the... Oh, this is another... And also the rearticulation of the notes to be sustained, which is only natural when we consider the, the, the fact that once the keys, the, the strings are uh, struck, they start their decay process. Also, he uses um, several uh, different types of counterpoint between both hands and or with electronic sounds, which may be of different types, including harmonics of a fundamental piano sound, with, which is the case we saw when I spoke about this empty register technique. So this is another example of this counterpoint. And um, last, the use of note reservoirs to be played in random order for a given period of time. This feature is used extensively in, in temporary at one occasion, as I've pointed out. In the earlier work, Pyramid de Cristal, we noticed 25 instances in which that procedure is applied, whereas in Abyssus Ascendens ad Eternum Splendorem, a total of five reservoirs is used. In the two chamber works in analysis, Team Shell and Entro Aria Perfeição, there is a sparing use of this technique, which is nonetheless expanded to include sustained interventions over the strings in the extreme registers of the piano. So this example is uh, from Intempore. To conclude, I should remark that in the aspects I focused, it seems obvious that the experience João Pedro Oliveira gathered as a performing organist shaped his writing for the piano in works including the piano and combining it with other instruments and or electronic means. One is drawn to ask if the interaction of electronics with a piano allows the composer to create a sort of mega instrument in which some acoustic features typical of the organ are extended, such as expanded and individualized registers and what he has called empty sonorities, but also issues concerning the specialization of sound and even the spiritual motivations that hide behind each work at the same time that he seeks a degree of definition, textual refinement, and percussive quality of sound production that the organ cannot achieve. 
This hypothesis may explain the composer's apparent move away from the organ as the center of interest at the same time that grows in his production the number of, of works featuring the piano. There are obviously other possible explanations to that fact, ranging from psychological or sentimental reasons to the availability and accessibility of both instruments, as well as the specific requests of interpreters and commissions. In any case, if the organ has been the starting point for João Pedro Oliveira's career as a performer, it also stands as a towering influence upon his interest in, uh, upon his interest in electroacoustic procedures and his pianistic writing, which is nonetheless very much id idiomatic. Indeed, the issues we discuss that are most evidently related to the organ's characteristics appear in a tissue of specifically pianistic elements. In this confluence of paths, João Pedro Oliveira leaves his performance room for choice and the building of personal interpretational strategies. Thank you very much. Questions? Answers? <laughs> <laughs> I like that one. <laughs> uh, I was wondering if uh, you would consider amongst all the, the techniques that the composer uses, if um, you observe as well some in the empty register, something like, I mean, the place for the imagination to, per, to, 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 to perform as this, this kind of sustained sound, I mean, there are so many possibilities. I actually mentioned the, the, that case of empty sonorities in both uh, when I was talking about you know, this register issue and uh -huh. also when I was talking about the counterpoint that sustains those notes that are supposed to be sustained. Because actually he uses the same process in both ways when he wants to do one and the other thing. So even if there isn't, I mean, amongst other possibilities, I mean, you see still an extra one, I mean, that could imagine a sound being sustained. Even. Well, actually, what, what happens is that th those elements that I try to, you know, uh, extract um, and, and uh, systematize, those elements are combined in different ways all over the piece and the other pieces too. I just chose this one because it's particularly um, interesting in, in that sense because it combines very, very many of these techniques in a, in a particular way and a very imaginative way. I was expecting that uh, um, the, the organ uh, instrument very, uh, whose history is very connected with improvisation uh, would be a part of uh, um, João Pedro Oliveira's work, so I didn't... Uh, that's, that's a very interesting question, because one of the things, this is also related to another issue that's very important for him, which is the, 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 the time, uh, dealing with time. And um, what happens is, he, very often he doesn't use, I mean, he does use those note reservoirs in which you have a group of notes and you're supposed to play them in any order for the time duration he indicates. So that's one basic thing, you know, it's not real improvisation, but it gives you some leeway to do things that are not totally written. But most important in what concerns improv improvisation is that he tries to, he doesn't include it in, in, in his piano works, but he, he tries to imitate somehow the freedom of improvisation. I, I was, you know, we're a little bit out of time, but um, I was, uh, if, if I have 10 minutes, I'll, I'll, I would like to, to have you listen to the piece with the score. And you'll see the contrast between what we hear, which is a, a apparent total freedom, and what is written, which is a strict 4-4 measure all the way through with a beat which corresponds to 60 you know, beats per, per, per minute. So it's very strict writing and very straightforward, but at the same time you have this feeling of total freedom. How does he get to that effect? Well, he uses this counterpoint between electronics and the piano. He always uses these figures that either in accelerando or um, rallentando, and in combining this from the piano and the electronics, he gives us this impression of no time, no time signature, no nothing precise. So, you know, if, if, if we do, do have those 10 minutes, I'll yeah. probably go for it.
<coughs> Can you tell me if the if the uh, electronics were notated specifically? I couldn't track if they're not the exactly signal. specific. They're they're suggestive. Uh -huh. So you so know the, the performer sounds are, are emanated, are generated how? Well, they're electronically generated. Some of them from the piano and then transformed, uh -huh. and some others just synthesized. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But there's some matrix of, of piano sounds that he uses as a basis for the tape. So this is a tape. This is a tape. Follow. This yeah. is not generated in time. No, no, this is not real time. Yeah. This is a, a tape. Mm -hmm. So basically, there's it, you, we're, you're interacting with something that pre-exists, that is fixed and in a support. He generated. He generated it. it. So if another pianist was going to do this piece, the tape would come along with the score. Sure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm that makes it very easy for performing it. Yeah. In real time, you often have the problem of you know, having to interact directly yeah, with the composer. Right. So. Uh -huh. right. mm. Synchronization here is mm. yes. <laughs> yes. Mm. So very fascinating, very good that we could hear the piece itself. It was yes. very, yeah. very yeah. exciting. And of course, the history of piano music is full of such use of piano, uh, uh, imitating uh, other instruments, like uh, Chopin did it by, by Bel Canto, imitating song, so that the piano can be used for many purposes. But, but um, in this case, I remember the theory by Heinrich Bessler on the spiel figure and the playing figures, which are the, such figures which are just easy to perform, let's say, by piano, by organ. Mm -hmm. And so on this level, certainly there is some interaction between the organ and, like in Franz Liszt, who also wrote for piano and 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 and, yes. uh, and, and Messiaen, other case. But uh, did you find on the uh, discourse level, when this music consists of a certain um, rather um, um, discrete ele elements, so like sound events, uh, did, did you find any any narrative? I mean, that any any narrative program or any any idea of composer or how it uh, well, unfolds this uh, he, he, work? He certainly does always have a very strong formal sense. And he always thinks his music in terms of, of a formal arch that has a culminating point and then comes down from it again. So this is a, a recurrent feature in, in his music and obviously it's uh, also used in, in this one. So there's a building up of tension and then a, a, a coming down from that tension that has been built uh, at, a, at a certain point, you know, a little bit after the... the half piece has gone through so this is this is a key element i don't think there is a specific program but for each one of his works there is one idea that's underlying so in the case of this piece and, and very often those uh, ideas are stemming from a very particular uh, sense of uh, spirituality uh, that that he's, uh, is his own, I mean, it's his, his own universe. In the case of this piece, that's not really the case uh, specifically, but here he, he really wants to deal with time, so that's why the piece is called In Tempore. Uh, this, this play with time, the, the idea that uh, we're dealing with the music in time, we're doing music in time, but we're playing with time in the sense that we're creating an illusion. Of course, for all of you who listen following to the score, it's very easy to, to see that it's clear cut and, and very strict and very, you know, easy at, if, if we think about a, a metrical uh, approach. But in fact, when we hear it without having the support, we, we're actually puzzled because we don't really get I mean, at the first hearing, at least, we don't get this feeling of, of a, a, such a stable pulse. So that's what he means, that that was the idea he was pursuing while writing this piece. I mean, having this uh, interplay with time. So this, I mean, if this can be considered a program, then yes, that, that, that would be the program here. Because you don't have it uh, on real time, because it's taped, it puts on the performer. Well, you know, dealing with electronics, um, mm. Is, is a very tricky uh, matter in that uh, what you're saying uh -huh. because there's many different types of approaches. Of course, the two extremes are the tape uh -huh. and uh, you know uh -huh. uh, real-time interaction. Um, when when you have real-time interaction, you can also be very much controlled. I'm you know think about a MIDI system where all the keys have sensors and the computer responds to you pressing those keys at that moment, and if you don't do it, then the computer doesn't respond. Mm -hmm. Well, that's another kind of pressure. Mm -hmm. Here, you know, it's, of course, it's, it, it's like playing chamber music with, mm -hmm. it is 
like I, I wouldn't like to say this, but it's almost like karaoke. You know? Uh, you, you know, chamber music. You're dealing. You're trying to interact. You're trying to to mix with something that's fixed, and that idea is is quite weird. Once you get used to it, you get to know the tape part, so that you you deal with what you have to play, in in a sense that renews each time your interaction with the tape. And if, if you get to do that, then you know it's it's not that much um, of, of, of a burden, I would say. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if, even if it's a tape, you see it like a live animal, basically. Pardon me? Even if it's a tape, you see it like a live animal. Basically. Yes, <laughs> I try to. <laughs> <laughs> and there's certainly many different ways of looking and hearing things. So um, I think as in all music, it, it all depends on your, your ability as a performer as a performer, to look upon a score you know with fresh eyes each time you approach it. Yeah.